Have you been trying to get into classical music and had a hard time? Then this is the video for you. Hello and welcome back to Meet Mozart. I'm Angie, that's Mozart, and today we're going to be discussing why it's actually difficult for a lot of modern audiences to listen to classical music and really appreciate it and get something out of it. I've seen a lot of videos on YouTube about how to appreciate classical music, but I realized a lot of them weren't talking about why it's difficult to appreciate classical music in the first place. And while I did intend for this discussion to be part of a video um, about how to appreciate art song, which is a video that we will do in the near future, I wanted to just take the time to talk over the kind of trends that have come up, especially in Western and American culture that have made getting to know classical music a little bit tricky if you aren't really in that world. So let's get started. Many, many moons ago, and we're talking like Renaissance era, there wasn't such a huge difference between the folk music that was part of society from the highest echelons to the lowest and other types of music like madrigals and church music. Yes, those styles did vary from one another in different ways, including how they used a melody or the counterpart or what type of text they were using, etc. But they were more or less the same aesthetic and they were using a lot of the same instruments and the vocal style was pretty similar between all of them. So then as some of these larger art forms like operas, oratorios, symphonies, etc., started to appear, they were really just expanding on that same aesthetic. And despite the fact that there have always been singers and instrumentalists who pushed the boundaries of their instruments or composers that expanded on style and harmony and everything else, that's more or less how things remained for the next 200 or so years. And as opera, art song, all of these things continued to grow, they really were the popular music of their time. And composers acknowledged that in the way that they chose to write the music. For example, there were always popular dance forms like minuets and waltzes. And you would hear echoes of those dance styles in the context of an aria or a symphony. So the classical music of the time was completely integrated with the aesthetics of society. Now, of course, the people who were promoting these major classical works were generally nobility and patrons of the art who could fund the productions. But even so, the music was permeating the entire culture. In fact, there's a really great story about Verdi's Rigoletto, wherein Verdi held on to one of the Duke's big arias until the day of the performance, because he knew that if he gave it to the performers too soon, and it was such a catchy tune, that they would be walking all over the place, humming and singing this tune, and all of Italy would know it before the premiere of the show. And he was right, because once the piece did premiere, it was a song that was picked up by gondoliers and sung regularly in Venetian boat rides. What aria was that, you ask? Well, this one, of course. La donna è mobile, qual piuma al vento, muta d'accento e di pensiero. La donna è mobile. That's going to be stuck in your head all day, and you are welcome. So if classical music, operas, symphonies, etc., were the popular music of the day that was completely integrated into the popular trends of society, where did things start to diverge? Well, one thing we have to look at is that around the turn of the century, getting into the 1900s, 
new types of music started to come into play. Things like ragtime and jazz and cabaret. And what was great about those genres was that they started to pull in musical influences from other cultures. And so more and more people from other types of places in the world were able to really grasp on to those things. They weren't just pure Western music. But even with the evolution of these other genres, they often shared a lot in common in terms of the musical complexities. So there were complex rhythms that were coming into play. There were really interesting harmonies. And even the melodies and the tunes of these songs were not easy little melodies to sing along with. They were pretty complex in and of themselves. And so it wasn't such a big leap for someone to be able to appreciate ragtime at their local speakeasy on one night and then go see an opera the next because the musical integrity was still very, very high up on the list. And in terms of the vocal style, those things actually were very similar to how classical opera singers were singing. In fact, if you were to take a look at cabaret singers from the 1930s versus opera singers in the 1930s, you would find that they actually have more in common in terms of the way that they're using their voice with each other than they do with their modern counterparts. Then, of course, we hit the 1950s, where genres like rock and Motown start to take center stage. And, of course, these offered people a lot more options in terms of the different types of music that they could listen to. But I don't think that that competition in and of itself has anything to do with where we have come to as a society in terms of being able to appreciate both rock music and classical music. The biggest shift that happened between those genres, in my opinion, actually has less to do with the genres themselves than with the way that they were being supported financially. In classical music, as we mentioned before, in the early days, those pieces were supported by nobility. And even to this day, although we don't really have a traditional sense of nobility, there are still patrons of the arts that are paying for organizations, paying for commissions, and pushing the classical art form forward financially. Genres like rock and pop, on the other hand, are supported by record labels. Now, before I get into this whole thing, I just want to say that I'm fully aware that there are lots of exceptions to what I'm going to say. There are also lots of genres besides pop and classical, but I'm referring to pop because it's become sort of the unavoidable music of our culture. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't matter what your opinion about it is, you're going to hear that as you go about your day. So record labels were supporting all of these other genres, and record labels, unfortunately, are about the bottom line. They need to make money, period. And in order to do that, they had to start putting out music that was as easily accessible to as many people as possible in the shortest amount of time as possible. And what I mean by that is this scenario. So say, for example, you are walking down the street, it's a hot day, you pass an ice cream shop, and of course you're going to stop and get that ice cream, because, like, why wouldn't you? But it turns out that a lot of people have also had the same idea because they're also very hot, and so you end up having to wait in line. As you're standing in line, you start to realize that your hips are starting to move a little bit. Your body is starting to move. And then you tune into the fact that there's some music playing. And in the course of the time that it takes you to get up to the front of the line, taste every free sample that they're going to offer you because you know you're not going to miss a chance to taste as many flavors as possible, pay and get out of the ice cream shop, you have heard the same melody over and over and over again multiple times, and you've perhaps even hopped on your phone and sound hounded it to find what that melody is so that you can go and continue listening to it on YouTube or buying the album. Now imagine that you walk into that same ice cream shop in the same scenario, but instead of playing a top 40 hit, they're playing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony with the Ode to Joy. 
unless you walk into that ice cream shop in the exact moments whenever Beethoven is developing that theme, you aren't going to know that you heard that piece. And it's going to sound like white noise, and then you're not going to buy it. So on the one hand, pop music has become oversimplified to be able to catch as many people as quickly as possible. And on the other hand, you have modern composers of classical music that are standing on the shoulders of people like Wagner and Debussy and Schoenberg, who thought they could completely re-envision the way that people even heard music. And so modern classical composers are trying to continue to push harmony forward, continue to push even the way that we use instruments forward. So if you are a typical person in modern America who hasn't studied classical music and you want to get to know it better, you either have to backtrack to people like Mozart, who you could probably say from an appreciation level that, you know, this is very interesting music and there's a lot going on, but you're not going to connect to it because we no longer dance minuets. Or you have to try to listen to modern musicians who are pushing things forward in such an advanced way that once again it becomes very hard to connect. And so this is the conundrum that we're sort of finding ourselves in as a culture. The other major way that this mass-marketed production of recorded music contributed to this gap was by making music a spectator sport. Think about it. If you were alive in the 1800s and you were just hanging out in your house and you wanted to listen to some music, how did you do it? You didn't call on Alexa. You had to make the music yourself. And if you didn't play an instrument, that meant that you sang the music yourself. And I think one of the reasons that art song really reached its heyday in the 1800s was because it was coming alongside this push where musical education was still a priority and it also became very popular for people to have a piano in the house. So perhaps not everyone in the family was a great pianist, but there were at least a few people around that could play piano and support a singer. And so whenever someone like Franz Schubert came out with a new open of art songs, it was sort of like Beyonce dropping a new album today because it made that music accessible without having to go to a concert hall. And it also meant that because the people in your house were participating in the music, they had a deeper connection and understanding to the nuances of that music. This switch to music being seen more as a spectator sport not only affected our general relationship with music, but it also changed how we value ourself in music making. And here's what I mean. Raise your hand if you were ever brave enough to sing along with the radio in front of some friends and someone stops you and asks, who sings this song? Celine Dion, you answer, and they say, great, let her sing it, basically telling you to shut up. There's no shame, my friends, I have been there too. And if you're watching this, you know who you are. And when those kind of events happen, we start to get the idea that if we can't sing like Whitney Houston or Ariana Grande, then we can't sing at all. And that is just false. That's like saying, if I can't cook like Anthony Bourdain, may he rest in peace, I shouldn't cook. Or worse, I shouldn't eat. Or if I can't do math like Albert Einstein, I shouldn't add. And I think when we put that mentality in relation with other things, we see how preposterous it is. But when it comes to the arts, and especially music, that is the accepted mentality, and it's just wrong. <laughs> because even though there have always been and will always be people who push their instrument to new levels and make us wonder at how they do it, those things, while impressive, are not actually what music is about. And so we disengage ourselves from that whole other process because we can't imagine ourselves doing this one crazy impressive thing.
So obviously I could probably keep ranting on this subject for a little while, but we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up and talk about the things that we can actually do to start appreciating classical music and sort of break ourselves out of these other mentalities that we've developed. So first of all, it's really important to experience music. And I know that most people are gonna suggest that that means going to see a live concert. And I'm totally down for that. I think that's a great idea, especially that now it looks like we may actually start having those again. But another way would be to just pick a piece that you always wanted to get to know and listen to that piece over and over and over again. And maybe each time you listen, you try to focus on a specific aspect of the music. Like maybe each time you listen to a different instrument and see how those layers work together. Obviously, it would also be great for you to subscribe to a channel like this one, where whenever we present music, we always talk about the history of that piece and we help to point out different things that are in the composition so that when you're hearing it you have something to be listening for that will bring it a little closer to you. But maybe my best most important and undoubtedly least popular piece of advice would be to reclaim your God-given right to participate in music. If you are 50 years old and you have always wanted to play piano go take piano lessons. If you have always wanted to sing with that choir or that community theater group, do it. And if you feel afraid to audition and you need help in gaining confidence, find yourself a voice teacher. And if you think that no teacher is gonna take you seriously because you're not a professional and you can't do it as well as your favorite pop singer, I think you would be pleasantly surprised as to how many teachers there are out there, especially at this time in history, who will be glad to support you and guide you and be in your corner and cheer you on whenever you make any type of progress, whether it's big or small. And if you don't find that teacher right away, keep looking because I promise you they are out there. Okay, guys, I think my soapbox is worn out for the day, so we're going to end it there. But we are planning to do some videos that will be guides to understanding and appreciating art, song, and opera, which are the main genres that we talk about on this channel. So please be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss those. But in the meantime, please be sure to like and comment because I'm sure there are more thoughts on this subject and I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I'd love to continue the conversation in the comments below. So go ahead, push all the fun buttons, and and we'll see you next time.